Welcome to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. I am your host, Dr. Onit Lev, an emergency and addiction doctor who has served at the White House and still practices on the front lines. Right here on High Truths, you will learn from experts, hear stories from the emergency department, and listen to people who have struggled from addiction. Friends, fentanyl is plaguing America. It has infected all illicit drugs, from cocaine to meth, counterfeit pills, and even marijuana. If you are around someone who may be using drugs, you should carry naloxone, the opioid reversal agent. Carrying naloxone for drugs is like carrying an EpiPen for allergies. If you need a prescription for naloxone, you should have one, no questions asked. That is why I am offering a free prescription to anyone who needs one. Come visit me on hightruths.com to learn more about the show, submit a question, or download a free prescription for naloxone. And if you like the show, do me a favor. Give us a five-star review and subscribe. Your stars are very much appreciated and go a long way in supporting the program. Today's episode is sponsored by Isaac, the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis. Visit their website, isaacone.org, I-A-S-I-C one dot org to follow the science on marijuana. Hello, everyone again. Thank you for joining me for another high and mighty conversation on High Truths. I'm your host, Dr. Roni Lev. High Truth fans know that I get jealous very easily. I'm jealous of COVID for hogging all that tension and money while people are dying of fentanyl. I'm jealous of sexually transmitted diseases that get mapping, contact tracing, partner antibiotic prescriptions without a medical visit, and wish we had the same for overdoses. I am jealous of Colorado for their marijuana consumer protection legislation and wanted to copy some of that for California. And today, I'm jealous of Canada. Canada has passed cannabis consumer information website when they legalized marijuana in 2019. They created a reporting system for adverse reactions. Serious reactions must be reported to the Health Canada within 15 days of becoming aware of them. Hospitals, individuals, and industry are reporting these adverse events to the Canadian Vigilance Program. It's the same reporting agency that collects adverse events on all medications or medical devices. I looked at their reporting form that included 20 questions. If this was law in California, I would be filling out many forms a day. That would be for cannabis-induced psychosis, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, cannabis drug interaction, cannabis stroke-like symptoms that were really not a stroke, cannabis causing seizures. You know, on second thought, I'm no longer jealous of Canada or their cannabis uh, reporting system. Um, That would be way too much work for me. I would prefer the CDC collect reported data like they do for COVID and for opioids, data on hospital visits, pediatric exposures, as well as medical examiner data that includes drug deaths, suicides, homicide, and accidents. And with that, let's hear our question of the day. Hi, my name is David Escovito. I'm the Community Organization Specialist at Mental Health Systems, North Inland Substance Use Prevention. Um, A big part of my work is really just mobilizing the community to battle against substance use, to prevent substance use in our community with young people, with adults, and we really work hard on the ground, inside the schools, and um, it's really a joy to do what I do. Um, I really love this podcast, High Truths. Uh, I appreciate Dr. Lev. She's such a great asset to our community, and she's always willing to really just help and get behind Um, substance use prevention, especially when it comes to prescription drugs. Um, But my question today is, what is the best way to protect youth from the marijuana industry? Thank you, David, for your important and effective work in prevention. Protecting our youth and working on prevention is key to decreasing the incidence of addiction nationwide. I have a great expert on the show today to answer your question. Pamela McCall is from Canada. I love our international guests and have prepared for Pamela with a Canadian accent. Pamela is an expert about 
smoking cessation, which led her to be an advocate on the harms of marijuana. A boat is my only Canadian word. She is famous for her smoke-free version of classic Twas the Night Before Christmas. She also wrote a couple books on marijuana. One is The Pied Pipers of Pot, Protecting Youth from the Marijuana Industry. You can find Pamela McCall's bio on the High Truth show notes. Pamela McCall, welcome to High Truths. Hi, nice to be here. Pamela, you're Canadian, eh? I am Canadian. I own a property in the United States. Who I, I actually would like to be an American, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. I, I think I uh, identify as an American. But there you go. I asked you that just so I could say a, because that's like the, the only <laughs> little Canadian that I know. Right. Um, uh, tell us about your passion about being a spokesperson and author on the harms of uh, marijuana. Well, you know, I started it because I was really concerned about youth and children and I have a, a real problem with predatory industries and, and people who go after kids. I, I just it's something that's just at the core of my my beliefs, I guess, that we should protect children. It's just fundamental to the, what I do. We got into this, um, you know, and I started between the damage, the science and my own family. I started some of the things I hadn't realized, like Turner syndrome. Um, different things in my own family, my children, not my children, but my, my siblings and their children, the damage that marijuana had done to their lives. And so that took on a whole new level for me. Um, and my brother was in Scotland. He has two, you know, young adult male children who are both in psychiatric wards with onset of um, marijuana induced bipolar and schizophrenia. So I've seen two young men who were, you know, right at the prime of their life getting going here and just, you know, really devastated. Yeah, that is very sad. And, and you said you talk about um, the what, what bothers you about um, predatory behavior of industries against children. So it didn't probably start with uh, marijuana, right? That's a recent thing. No, it started um, with tobacco because I, um, I've been publishing since about 1995, I guess it was, somewhere in there. And I was looking for a project back in 2012 to work on for myself, not publishing somebody else's work, but my own. And I want to do some advocacy work. And so I, I was thinking of doing something about anti-tobacco. And I, I realized that Twas Night Before Christmas, the famous poem, um, had always had the smoking Santa Claus. And in 2012, there was an edition that came out with smoking on the cover and in six pages. So, you know, it's 2012. You know, the Master Settlement Agreement was 1998, which made it illegal to use smoking in association with cartoon characters. So in 2012, we still had editions coming out with smoking all over them. So I came out with a smoke-free edition, no pipe, no Santa smoking, and it went around the world. I mean, Stephen Colbert did a spoof on me, Barbara Walters got involved, um, Brian Williams, NBC Nightly News, and the whole thing sort of kicked into gear um, and went global. And so, you know, that whole episode really built me a platform. Um, it could have gone nowhere. I mean, I wrote a 500 word media release. I sent it out myself. It wasn't professional. It wasn't like some big PR firm. And I was woken up, I think it was September the 12th of 2012 by CBC Halifax. So it was like 5 a.m. in the morning. And they said, have you seen the cover of the National Post newspaper? And I said, no. And they said, you're page one and page two. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that was like the beginning of ridiculousness. OK, well, because then the New York Post got in touch and Vanity Fair and uh, and the story went everywhere. And so, as I said, it, it afforded me a platform. It afforded me an opportunity to get out there and talk about predatory industries and how they go after our children. And so, you know, the marijuana comes later, um, but I really, it was that platform that afforded me the opportunity to work in marijuana policy. So, um, and then of course the passion that came with it because I, I actually, being from Vancouver in Canada, I also saw the launch of the marijuana industry into this country through Tilray and Private Air Holdings. And so I was up close and personal with this stuff. And when Patrick Kennedy, I invited Patrick Kennedy, who was one of the co-founders of SAM USA to come to Vancouver, which he did do. Um, I met with the film crew from ABC Australia who were doing a documentary, including on Tilray. And that's how I really got involved. And Tell us what, what that is, Tilray. Till Privateer Holdings is the biggest marijuana enterprise out of America. Um, they're funded by um, major entities and they have um, 
three men that started it were from Yale University and they were very well connected and they sort of launched the whole marijuana industry in America. And what they did was they started a company called, they were out of Seattle and they started Tilray as a branch because as you know, Canada was in the process of legalizing marijuana for non-medical use, right? Mm -hmm. And so they set up in our country because they wouldn't dare do it in America. They use us as their launching pad to then go around the world. And that's what they've done, right? Mm -hmm. So that's who Tilray was. And I, um, if you haven't seen Cannabis Inc., um, I definitely recommend it. It was a documentary. Kevin, Kevin Savat and I um, and Patrick Kennedy were all involved in it. And it's a great documentary on the early, early, right? Early when this started. And uh, Patrick Kennedy's interviewed at length. Um, and so are the boys from Tilray. And you've got... Um, Brennan Kennedy of Tilray saying that, you know, I'm not going to quote him directly here. I'll just say verbatim, not verbatim, but he gave the impression that there's no harm to marijuana. No one's ever been harmed by it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Yeah. So I think down the road, we all need to remember that document, remember that documentary. And, you know, if we ever need evidence, <laughs> it's right there on tape. Right. right. People are still saying that. Right. Yeah, well, yeah, interesting, which leaves us to quackery, but that's another concept. But it, it, so anyway, that's sort of how that all got going. Um, and, uh, you know, it was really privateer holdings in Tilray in Canada. But, you know, um, we fought the fight up here. But as you know, we lost. Um, but we can talk about that if you want to the advocacy part of it. It's yeah. We will. Um, but I'm intrigued with the, it was the night before Christmas so, mm -hmm. and we don't want Santa be, to be smoking. Um, is there any equivalent to that now that you see um, if for marijuana? Is there a cartoon character? Or actor oh, sure. Or oh, yeah. sure. There was a store, I think it was in Santa Barbara or San Diego, somewhere down there. And they actually put Santa Claus with a marijuana joint or something on their windows. Mm. And a whole bunch of parents got together and went crazy. <laughs> And they have oh. to take down their picture of Santa with a joint. There was somebody else in Alaska who dressed up like Santa Claus and he was promoting marijuana for medical purposes um, for some condition that Santa had. Oh, <laughs> but Santa! We, but see, the Master <laughs> Settlement Agreement of 1998 under the presidency of Bill Clinton, they made it illegal to use cartoon characters, right? Yeah. You, you cannot use a cartoon character to advertise tobacco products do we um, have that same type of protection for for pot well no we don't mm. but it, it, i think it's more it's more sort of public opinion and and sort of yeah i know the master settle agreement is a tobacco document it's not a marijuana document right right but i i just feel like we should apply the same kind of like uh, because we see that it's like oh we got rid of smoking indoors but now you can do vaping like that's not <laughs> we worked well, so hard. I, yeah, but we've we've tried so hard i mean you know you bring in the workers you know all the worker legislation and, and laws that protect workers from working in a smoke a smoke environment because of damage to their health right mm -hmm. yeah those laws can be applied to marijuana smoke so you Absolutely. could have a you could have something happening indoors, but who's cleaning the place? And if there's any damage, they have compensation. They have a claim, right? So there's, it's a lot of the peril, the things that happen in tobacco do do happen with marijuana, of course, right? That's right. And I want to I want to talk more about that, but let's get to David Escovito's question. Sure. Uh, David um, works in prevention with youth, and his question is, what's the best way to protect our youth from the marijuana industry? It looks like that's been your passion now for many years. So what's the best way um, for- Well, I was at the United Nations in Vienna and the Kiwanis of America gave a speech on this very topic about educating youth and what they were doing in the schools and their programs. And I asked a question, which is, do you really think that you can educate a youth to go up against big industry? Do you really think you can equip your kids to go up against these predatory industrial leaders who, create campaigns with the money, you know, that like enormous marketing dollars, right? Mm -hmm. It's so um, covert, right? It's so, um, I don't know, it's just so manipulative and so wrong, just like tobacco. Mm -hmm. And so I think to protect youth, you have to have, 
you know, laws in place like we're just talking about that you can't have advertising that's attractive to youth. You know, you have to be able to control the industry. Um, and, and I think that's probably the number one thing because when you look at tobacco, the biggest campaigns, most successful campaigns ever were the truth campaigns out of Florida, which, you know, really laid it out for youth that this industry is out to get you as one of their customers. They don't care if you're gonna die, they don't care, right? That really impacted youth, the, the truth campaigns. They're, they're world-class gold standard campaigns, right? And so, but I think, I mean, they've done lots of studies that show that parents who are very strongly opposed to drugs, um, their kids are less likely to use. I think if you have a parent who's not afraid to have the conversation and to be hard on the topic and, and factually correct and give them the right science, there's science that shows that that can have an impact on, on uh, you know, reducing use. I think that, you know, like things like getting a driver's license you know, and not having a really good grasp of your kid's drug use, marijuana use. You know, I think that you need as a parent to step in and be responsible and make sure your kids aren't using anything if you're gonna give them the keys to the family car. Like there's gotta be conditions. I mean, I'm a parent, um, you know, I, I'm a bit of a, you know, be a parent. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Lay well, it out. A lot of parents are being, the campaign is also towards the parent. They have no idea. They think it's just so oh, mellow pot that they used when they were a kid. They don't realize that we're dealing with high potency THC. So I think a lot of parents, um, to their defense, think, oh, it's just pot because they're yeah. thinking of what, you know, the less than 3% THC of their youth. They don't realize that's not what their kids are getting into. Yeah, I, I think the big piece that people seem to be missing is the reproductive health, mm -hmm. the male reproductive health and the testicular cancer. You know, I think if 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 parents were educated better on what this what marijuana, what you know, THC and CBD can do as far as suicide risk and reproductive health, I think if those messages could get out there, I think people would be more engaged. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a parent about reproductive health and they don't have a clue. They have never heard of it, right? I, I, don't, I, don't, so, I don't think many doctors. You know, and, and when we, that. no, that's right. Out in the House of Commons, when we were legalizing marijuana, I was really, really involved. And I put forward through the conservative party, the opposition, of course, because the liberals were all pro pot. Um, I put through a list of people to speak before the House of Commons. And I lobbied, I went to the different MPs to get these names. And one of them was Dr. Stuart Reese. And as you probably know, he's very well educated and um, has very strong opinions, but he also has a lot of science behind him on reproductive health. Yeah. And so he's miraculously, I get a phone call from Stuart Reese and he goes, guess what? I've been invited to speak for 10 minutes at the House of Commons. And I went, <laughs> that is the best news I've had in years because we hadn't legalized this yet. This was, these were the hearings to discuss if we were going to do it. Right. Yeah. And, um, and then I get a call from Stuart a few days later. He goes, I've been uninvited. Oh. And I said, what did you do? And he goes, I sent them what I was going to say. Oh. They uninvited him. They don't that want was to hear terrible. about They didn't want to hear about reproductive health, right? They didn't want to hear about it. And yeah, and autism. That and was a bad system. day. That was a bad day. Yeah. And then I testified um, before the, this is like, you know, trying to get the information into the hands of decision makers and the public. This is what I did. And, you know, and I went, I was chosen to speak before the task force. I made a presentation that was six hours long. I was in a room That's with a 20, lot of talking. 24 people. I went with at least, I think it was 17 inches of documents. I had petitions. I had signed, I had the science. I had everything, right? Mm -hmm. And I sat there and there was that, you know, the, the MPs and the, all the I mean, major people were in the room. It was, they had a panel and then they had 24 of us. And the first thing out of my mouth was I said to the head of the chair, Adam McClellan, who was the former health minister of our country. I held up a document from Health Canada that said, men should not use if they want to start, if they wish to start a family. And I held up this document out of the government of Canada. And I said, I need you to answer the question. How do you legalize a drug that you yourselves, the Health Canada says, men should not use if they wish to have children? How do you legalize that drug and not get sued down the road? Because you can't tell me that the majority of Canadians know that 
or what that means or the science that goes behind it. And you know what she said? No. What the said? lawyers for Health Canada were in the room too. And she said, I'm here to discuss how to legalize, not if. That's all she could say. Yeah. And then I spent the next six hours putting the science on the public record and you're not going to believe what happened next. They took it <laughs> After off. six hours of me doing my thing. I get up to go and I said, I think we had a coffee break or something. And I said, I think that's it for me. It was quite a hostile room and I was taking a bit of abuse. And I said, I, I think I'm done now. I don't think I'm going to stay the extra hour. And she said, well, that's fine. But she, I should, she said, this is, this, is a, this is the former minister of health of the country. This is not just some random human being, okay? This is, this is a hugely powerful, influential co-chair of the task force. She said to me, I just sealed the meeting for 50 years. What does no that one mean? ever will hear what you said. Oh, my God. No one will ever see anything you just said, and no one will ever hear it. She sealed and it. And that's why people don't trust government. <laughs> so get a load of this. Then I go to my own MP and I said, this is what she said to me. Can you look into it? And you know what happened? She, no. she came back to me and said, she didn't seal it for 50 years. She sealed it forever. Forever. No one will ever know what I did. Oh. So, you know, all right, so you were there for six hours testifying for Canada, um, and uh, we know the end of the story there. It's legal in Canada. Um, but how is uh, marijuana legalization treating Canadians? Tell us about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, I mean, I, I was sent something yesterday, you know how we all exchange information all the time, um, and it was talking about reproductive health and women, and I went, this is not a news bulletin, you know? Like we're just, this is, this is coming out of CTV news, our national news, right? And I went, they're so far behind. They don't pick up the story when it's important. What are we now? Years into legalization, they're starting to talk about marijuana and pregnancy. Like we know this, we've known this for a long time. You should have done that five years ago, right? So, I mean, we'll never, because our political system and our media are so intertwined. I mean, you have, you have CNN and you have Fox News, at least you guys are, outright and honest what side you're on <laughs> our media it's all covert again it's like it's all politicized but they don't really say it so you, they just don't report what the prime minister doesn't want you to hear about right so um so one of the problems that. you're seeing is uh reproductive health are, are you seeing other things like you know what i'm seeing uh, more psychosis more emergency visits are you seeing other things well like sure that? of course you know, and are you seeing and look with co and with COVID, we've seen increased use because everybody who stayed home and got depressed started using more marijuana. And you have the fancy schmancy. You know, they did more alcohol and more tobacco. Same type of high potency products and shatters and oils oh, yeah. and tinctures and all that. Oh yeah, no, I think we lead you guys. I think we've got you on that one. We're no. like this is like maybe not maybe not Seattle. Seattle's a gong show, but you know, bong show. But it's um, Vancouver's pretty bad. Yeah. What, but I think, what about anything good? Anything like I, I kind of went to the website on consumer information on cannabis and government of California. And they had um, serious warning labels that looked kind of interesting and good. It talked about drug interactions and dosing. I, um, are any of those good? Oh, no, 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 no. Anything good. It's the there? exact opposite, because what yeah. happened here was when you saw it go through the House of Commons into passed into legalization. We had warnings on there about mental health. We had warnings on there about pre pregnancy. The yeah. industry's gone in and just taken them off. So we've we have less warnings than we had four years ago. We don't have we don't have better warnings. We have less warnings. But I saw warnings about don't use if less than twenty five. Don't use if you have allergies or liver or heart or, or lung disease or family history of mental illness and pregnancy or lactation. Are, are, but that's on the, that's. Those. That's on one website that I have. I, it, miraculously, it is still up and running, but their main website doesn't say that. Their main website doesn't say that. You have to really search for that website. That and what about dosing? So the things that you showed from that one website, that's not, that's, I thought that that looked pretty good. It's great, but it's not their main website. That's an old website that happens to still be live because somebody at Health Canada obviously thinks it shouldn't be taken down, which is really great. 
yeah. but that's not if you have to search for that website that's not a that's not the main the thing that one. we would see and then i saw something that i thought looked interesting but then i had second thoughts about it but the reporting of side effects is that effective is that being used um you know i i don't know i, I don't know how much people pay attention to government the government does i think a large part of this, like David Musto, the um, uh, narcotics historian from, from Yale, he's now deceased, but he said that people stop using drugs or become more aware when they see damage, right? So I think the big thing is connecting the damage to marijuana, which I think we're still really falling behind on. Mm. You know, I don't think that people are really seeing like, because we don't have, you know, the roadside testing for drug driving, you know, we don't have a lot of the testing in place. We don't have a lot. We're way behind you on that. You know, I don't know why we level data, but we do. So, and driving fatalities from marijuana impaired drivers is way, we're two or three years behind you on our data. So, you know, we can't, you can't really make a compare. You can't really know what's, you can't really understand what's really going on unless you have data and we don't have it. So yeah, I don't think we have such great data either. You're better than uh, us. You're better than us. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yep. I, I just, um, it, it, the reporting looked interesting. It looked like the same thing that that we have in the United States as far as um, reporting adverse reactions to medications or medical devices. Right. Um, and uh, first I thought, oh, that'd be a, that's a good idea. And then I thought, no, I'd be reporting this every single day. That'd be like a full-time job. <laughs> I don't, it's not the right way to collect data. Um, yep. You know, there's better ways. Right. Um, so uh, I look at what I have in front of me. Right. <laughs> Pied Pirates on Pot. One of the many books you wrote as a publisher yeah. is, is uh, Twas the Night Before Christmas. Is that your first book? No, I did a whole bunch of things before that. Uh -huh. But I um, I just, uh, the mar I'm doing another marijuana book and then I'm retiring, I think, from publishing and I'll sort of choose what I'm going to do. Um, but I have one more marijuana book that I have to write because I have a really good title, which I can't tell you. And um, it's going to be hopefully pretty straightforward. Like that book that you just held out, The Pied Pipers of Pot. Yeah. I mean, it really was my filing cabinet that had to be out of my head. It, it was just one of those things where I wanted, to put it, I wanted to put it out there so that, you know, if I needed to look something up or something like, you know, like someone will call me up and say, what's your opinion on harm reduction? I say, look at page 67. You know, it's like, there it is. I laid it out for you. It's all there. Yeah. It's just, you know, with all the sources so that yeah. people can sort of find things. But this other book I'm working on, um, you know, I hope to sort of shake people up a little bit. I hope to just rattle a little bit that people will go, oh, you know, and uh, yeah. So hopefully within the year, I'll get that out. I have a really good title and half the thing of publishing is to have a really good title. <laughs> so interesting That's I have great. a really good title yeah well you're experienced and have that and um and uh so are, are all, most of your books about um you know some type of education like that with a message in my publishing yeah uh well I have an art background I was an art consultant for 25 years so I have this love of art and and, and I've done some art books and art publishing and things like that and yeah I I I don't know. I do whatever I sort of publish whatever I feel like publishing. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, the the marijuana advocacy. I um, I, mean, I was thinking about talking to you today, and I was just thinking, you know, I spent years on this, you know, and I don't know where I got to. Like, I don't really know if I was that successful. I think that probably the most successful thing I did was taking down that University of Washington study of pregnant women. Um, I spent four months doing that and I think I did it, even tell though it us, looks- tell us, tell us about that. Sure. Well, I, I saw that the University of Washington was recruiting pregnant women who were users of marijuana during pregnancy to study them. And so I, I, I looked at their Facebook pages. I looked at their Twitter accounts. I looked at their documents. I looked at what they were saying and I challenged them because I didn't think that they were being forthright. And I didn't think that they were telling the women um, the risks and, and giving them enough of a warning. And so it went to the ethics department of the University of Washington and they did make them change their protocols. Um, but I went a little further than that and I wrote to the White House and everybody else. And we actually had a meeting at the White House with their lawyers and we tried to take it down through with their help. Um, and then I went to the uh, all the different you know heads of health in your country and 
and got a lot of people to help me do that and challenged it. And we challenged it on the basis of the under human um, studies protocol, human rights, you aren't supposed to be doing studies on human beings if you've already done it on animals and it hasn't proven to be safe or it's not necessary to do because you already have the science. So we prove both those things. Um, Christine Miller, Dr. Christine Miller mm -hmm. and myself and a lot of other people. And, uh, and we went out there and we pretty well squashed that study. I have seen no activity. But the interesting thing was it was funded by NIDA and they have received another $200,000 in the last year since I did that. So I don't know where the results are. And Dr. Ken Finn and I actually wrote to the university saying, there's been nothing published and you're receiving money over and over again to the tune of about $450,000 of, of why America. Didn't you, why didn't you write to NIDA? I have written to NIDA. Yeah. I have over and over again. So um, I have a letter from the actually head of NIDA about this. And, and I wrote to the governor of Washington state and he said, I represent the university, not the children of the state. I have that, but however appalling that is. Um, but what was fascinating about the University of Washington study in their protocols was they said that they were, they um, were going to assess the children for, I think it was six months after birth on neurological damage and things due to marijuana use. Mm -hmm. But they disqualified, they pulled anybody out of the study whose child had spent more than 24 hours in ICU or neonatal care. What does that mean? <laughs> which had preterm labor because of their marijuana use. <laughs> so you're going to pull all the people out oh. whose child was in neonatal. Right. That, what kind of study is that, yeah. right? Right. There were really big problems with that study, but it ended up going to USA Today and, you know, it, it got to be, a, I was, you know, I was causing some, some ruckus and I tried to and, and, yeah. uh, and I think I got somewhere, but what? Are, so you you've dealt with uh, you know for been around for many years with uh, tobacco, and now kind of reliving history um, with marijuana. Mm -hmm. What are the? Tell us some analogies that you see um, uh, analogies in the harm and and in the industry, and then we could talk about analogies in prevention and fixing things. Well, I mean, it's just this this deceit, right? This this deceit on the industry side of not telling people the true risk factors. I mean, that's what happened. That's what tobacco was all about, right? You know, it wasn't until men, you know, started to understand the risks of heart attack. It wasn't long, it was heart first, um, that people started to, you know, quit smoking, you know? And uh, the one of the big things that is this nicotine replacement therapy that came along and, uh, you see, you see the patch for marijuana now, right? And it's the same scam. It's the same racket, you know, of um, just hooking people into this concept that by giving them the same drug at a different dosage, they're somehow going to become non-addicted. <laughs> it's just, you know, bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, at uh, least at least they're not getting it into their lung, right? That's the, for the nicotine replacement therapy. It is still nicotine, but it's not like this with all the other toxins that are going to your lungs but that's yeah. what i hear that people say well that's why you should have eat edibles because at least you're not you cooking. just you just quit you should just quit right <laughs> you need to quit these things are really bad for you they're you know, like you know the cbd and and if you look at the apodilex side effect profile and the risk of suicide you know you know liver damage kidneys all these things it's like People need to understand that they should just stop this stuff. It's, it's yeah, but that's not what the public is hearing. They're hearing I know. this is healthy. I know. It's good for my rheumatoid arthritis. I need it for my insomnia. That's what they're hearing. They're not hearing um, what you and I are saying. <laughs> We're just, you know, the two of us. It's gonna, you know. Well, but the thing is, the thing is, is it, it's an addictive product, right? So when you have someone addicted, they start saying things like you know, I, I need it to help me sleep. Well, that's because of the withdrawal. There, there are a <laughs> whole bunch of other ways to help you sleep other than taking a drug that could be actually really causing you major problems like suicide ideation or, you know, liver function like disorders. You know, I, I think yeah. it's like with tobacco, we used to, you know, sort of say that, you know, if, if someone, if there's no benefit, a human being won't do something. So you have to just buy it. You have to like 
find out what someone's belief system is about a certain subject or a topic or, or a substance, right? So with tobacco, people would say, well, it, it helps me de-stress. Well, I'd say, you know, you can be, there's all kinds of other people that are stressed who don't smoke. Like we got to deal with the stress, obviously not the tobacco. So let's deal with your stress. And then you just have to blast through every belief system till there aren't any left about the benefit of this thing. There are no benefits to marijuana, period. None. Zip. <laughs> Zip. Uh, well, you know, and, and you've are, got to look at the risk there, factors that there are, are. There are, to be fair, there there are benefits of THC and CBD, and they are FDA approved and studied. And I could write prescriptions for those things. Sure, right? sure. So it's not like but I mean, like street. Out. I mean, street. Like people just using it for like. I'm not talking about you know, pharmaceutical derivatives yeah. of, M of THC or CBD, which have a yeah. side effect profile can be prescribed and dose. That's a, to me, that's a different thing. Right. Um, you know, it's just like thalidomide. Thalidomide is a drug that could be prescribed if someone is screened for pregnancy. It's still used for leprosy, I think. So yeah, marijuana has some, marijuana doesn't, but THC, CBD in a in a pharmaceutical product that is administered by our doctor and dosed and has side effect profiles that are monitored, that's a different situation. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we can have some of the, uh, actually, I think that the, the cannabis industry is actually way stronger, better, smarter, because they learn from the tobacco industry. Now they're funding research and their products are more sophisticated and their marketing is even better. Um, they've, they've learned um, from what tobacco. Are they and what, are they, what are they funding? Um, and they think they're doing funding on, you know, how it helps for pain or, you know. Have you ever uh, seen studies from their funds? Have you ever seen results from their studies? In this country, Tilray went running around, gave a million dollars to a bunch of universities, haven't seen any study results. That made a headline, but they don't. I don't what, is, what studies do we have that show any benefit of this product? Any. Yeah. Other than what you've mentioned of SARS epidiolex or Sativex. They, 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 like do, ha they do have um, uh, poorly small numbered studies, but there are the bigger ones with 50,000 patients that'll show it's not helpful for, for pain or it's not, you know, it causes more opiate use disorder. But there are, uh, I've seen small little of uh, published studies and then they, they you know, fund, uh, industry funded and say, look, this is so wonderful. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'd be highly suspect of any industry funded study. And if you problem. look at Tilray, their vice president, their vice president, they stuck in a university grad program. Yeah, It'll, they'll be like the Sacklers of the future, right? <laughs> they're right. they're funded. Right? <laughs> they'll be like, um, highly suspect, highly suspect. Yeah, I don't know. I'd be checking out everything on that study. I, I like that idea of finding the solutions from tobacco with the truth campaign and doing the same kind of a thing for um, for for marijuana as far as creating an informed public and, and getting getting that as well, well. The gold standard of tobacco prevention is called denormalization. That is the gold standard. That's studied. It's documented. It's what we do. Mm -hmm. You denormalize the industry, not the individual. Okay. So we're not taking on the user, we're taking on the, the industry. And so our, I mean, way, way back when I first started work, working in marijuana, I said, we need to work on our language skills as a group, you know, the advocates, we need mm -hmm. to talk in a denormalization language, right? And we've never done that. And I think that's been one of our, our downfalls. It's interesting um, that you say that, because if anything, we're doing the opposite. We're so involved in um, stigma campaign. We will have to remove stigma and, and we should remove dis stigma for someone who has a disease of addiction. But that does not mean, move, mean removing stigma for use. We don't want people to use. That still needs stigma. Do you think that the fact that the lead marijuana um, advocacy group is called Normal for No Reason? Yeah, I mean, they're named normal because they know denormalization. They're so smart, these people. Yeah, they figured yeah. it out, make it normal because they knew darn well we were going to make it denormalized because that's the most effective campaign in the history of tobacco prevention was denormalization. And so mm -hmm. what do they do? They go out there and they call themselves normal, making us all draconian, you know, monsters who are all you know right wing 
people who just want to harm all the people who use marijuana. Like they, they thought that up. Okay. And actually we are, in my opinion, preventionists are more concerned with the individual than a harm reductionist because I have not become so jaded that I've given up on a person who uses a drug that they can't get off drugs. I have not become fatalistic. I do not believe that prevention is a waste of time. I do not believe that prohibition is a waste of time. I, the science is there, the history is there that backs me up. And I don't have, I have, I, I, I even go as far to say I have more compassion for the user because I believe in them. I believe they can get clean if they were given enough tools, you know, and enough support and the, and the right messaging, right? Mm -hmm. But they, the group with their immensely, you know, immense wealth and their, and their strategy, um, they knew we were coming for them with that angle and they came before, they got in there before we did. And I think that's been our biggest problem is not using denormalization. You know, you read some of the articles about denormalization. I mean, it's fascinating stuff on the way we should be speaking, right? The language a denormalization person uses um, to, attack the, to attack that industry behavior is very specific. Um, Let's give us some examples. I'm just trying to think. There's a really, really good professor in, in Canada who wrote a great article about this. I can get it to you. You should maybe post it. It's really good um, on how to speak about this, right? But yeah. it's just, you know, the industry, it's like, it's just always focusing on the industry and not the individuals. That's really the, the, the main task of denormalization, right? Place it there. You know, and the truth campaigns, they were, they were I mean, they are really what turned the tide. You know, I mean, the science came out in 1955 on marijuana, on tobacco. And so and the people marijuana. are listening, the truth campaigns are the campaigns that came out of uh, the Florida. tobacco settlement. And um, in, in that was a kind of a landmark move with the tobacco industry um, for tricking people that it's not addicting. And part of their um, settlement was creating advertisement to prevent tobacco use. Which was called, and, and, and what's really interesting about the master settlement agreement was, um, I mean, I went, I went to San Diego to meet Victor De Noble. Do you know who Victor De Noble is? No, tell us. You're an American. You know, if you guys had saints or you had um, like Sir Anthony or Sir Elton John, you should have him as your sir because. He's an amazing human being who saved a great many people's lives and you don't know who he is. And I don't fault you for that. Nobody does. But Victor De Noble was the scientist at Philip Morris who found out that his monkey's parts were being affected by tobacco. And he went to Philip Morris and he said, I got a problem with my monkeys. And they said, what are you studying monkeys' hearts for? You're supposed to be doing something on their, oh no, he found something wrong with their brains. And they say, you're supposed to be solving our problem of these men and heart attacks with tobacco. And he said, well, there's something going on with the monkey's brains too, right? There's, I guess it was cancer or something. They fired him, put him on a gag hour order. They killed all the monkeys and his whole, his whole lab disappeared, everything. And when this whole thing started burbling up, I guess other whistleblowers and people were coming along. He was sitting at his kitchen table with his wife and, um, and they were discussing, he, she said, I can't, he said, I can't do anything. I can't do anything because I'm on this gag order. And she said, well, you have to do something. So um, anyway, he sent something to the, to somebody, I don't know, some FBI or something, some picture he had of a monkey or something in code. And he was sitting at his kitchen table with his wife and the phone rang and it was Bill Clinton. And he said, get in the car outside. You're not safe. What? Get in that car. It's my men. And uh, we'll bring you to, to Washington, D.C. And we're going to protect you because we know you're not safe. And so they brought him to Washington and they got his testimony and that's how they got these guys. That's how they got them wow. with Victor De Noble. That's a great and story. Bill Clinton said to Victor De Noble, under the, under, the American, under the American laws, he said, I, you had this gag order, but he said, I am the president of the United States and under the law, I'm gonna protect you. I'll do everything to protect you. Talk to me, tell me exactly what you know. And he did. Wow, that's, I know. that's a great story. So I went to San Diego to meet the man because I wanted to meet him. <laughs> and amazing. I did. And he was great. And you know what he does? He travels around schools in America telling his story about his monkeys and tobacco. And he talks to about, I don't know, thousands of children every year. Still. Is he still alive? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, and that's what he does. All right, you need to put be in touch with him. Maybe I'll have him on High Truths. That is a great American. Okay. All right, let's get him. Great American. I'll yeah. tell him that you you'll knight him, sir. I would knight sir, him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, advice for um, uh, David Escovito, who works in profession. What's your What's your advice? Of what, what's the best way he can do besides denormalize <laughs> the industry and well, use that kind of language? And you know, like I have a you know a history and art background. I don't, I'm not medically trained in any way, shape, or form, um, but I took it upon myself to become educated. And so I think, as a parent, um, you know, somehow to take it on. I mean, I took it on. You've got to find a way to become educated on this topic and, and to, you know, reach out to other parents or to support groups or to people like you, like just people who, you know, can put them in the know, you know, like you have to, as a parent, take this on. I just, I don't think you can rely on your teachers and everybody else. I just think you have to take it on as a parent to become educated. And there are some great resources, right? Yeah. That's great. You know, and not hide under the blankets and go, oh, my kid's using marijuana. You know, there are there's so many things that can go wrong by using this drug. I mean, I have a niece with Turner syndrome. OK, they're now discovered. I've talked to the Turner Institute and Philip and um, Stuart Reese about this a long, long time ago. I said, can you look into the chromosomal damage caused by marijuana use? Because my brother-in-law used a lot of marijuana. It's now coming out. OK. Yeah. You know. As I said, I've got two nephews in Scotland in psych wards, okay? Um, you've got to start seeing, linking the damage with marijuana somehow. You've got to start asking the questions, you know, and, and, and reading the science. I mean, you've got to find a way to figure out this reproductive health issue because it's, as Stuart Reese has pointed out, it's generational, okay? It's not just your children, it's your grandchildren. It's a hundred year damage, DNA damage. That's a really scary concept, right? Yeah. Whole infertility package, right? You know, really serious. And we just have to be, we have to be able to step into these conversations as parents, you know, and, and, and take it on. Uh, yeah. It's, it's hard to have a conversation about something that you don't know anything about. We're sure we're, is. <laughs> so we, but I, I don't, I don't think the public kind of knows that. And that's, that's our challenge is how do we get that information out? Without um, overwhelming somebody so much that yeah, they just, they, you they know. Can't, I mean, I'm barely at cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, let, her, let alone multiple generations of DNA damage. People well, are not ready to hear that. I think where you start is you start with driving because that's something yeah. that people care about that one. That is they, true. It's also, it's like, um, you know, if you can get into the place where they understand that using marijuana, they're going to be impaired, but they could, they could not only harm themselves they could ruin someone else's life or kill someone right there's a human sort of there's this i think you can sort of get there with them on that topic because i think human beings really don't want to hurt somebody else right yeah. you might be reckless in your own little basement little with your friends doing your thing but if you get in a car and you might kill somebody i think you're going to think again i hope you are right yeah but I would well, be. I, I think you're right. Um, drug driving is something that's kind of universal. People don't. And if you could, you know, like if you if you could somehow, that's a perfect timeline too. When you're 16 or 17 in that zone when they're starting to use, mm -hmm. to say you can't drive, and I'm going to test you. You know, I'm going to get you know maybe those little kits you get, or or I'm I just you can't be driving and using ever, yeah. never, right? Yeah. So if you're if you're using, you're not driving. It's, it's a it's not a right. It's a privilege. And you're not going to take the family car and go out there and possibly kill yourself and ruin everybody's lives and somebody else's families, right? So, I mean, I had this conversation with a nephew the other day, and I just said, you know, you've really you've got to remember, you or maybe you're a part of a me generation, but if something happened to you, so many people's lives are ruined. Your parents, your siblings. I mean, really seriously think about what you're doing because you impact other people you really do and I don't think people understand that I think a lot of these kids think well what I'm doing so what it's no nobody's business but my own I, I don't think it's just kids I mean if I'm just you know, oh we're no living, yeah we're living in a pandemic where I think one of the mistakes the CDC made was saying masks are for someone else because people don't care about someone else the oh. masks are for you 
wear the mask for you. I wear a mask to protect myself, not for you, right? And that's worked for me uh, staying COVID free. I think that that, that's an example. (laughs) It does. We don't have to look far away from that. That's but you know it's about themselves. They do, but but I but I do find it interesting that the COVID message on masks, the whole world. There's two things that happened. One, everybody sat around waiting for evidence from science evidence based you know evidence based science for the vaccine right mm-hmm. everybody heard it right we need evidence based science before we start doing vaccines but there is people there are people using cbd and thc I know, (laughs) I know, I know. I laugh at that. If I say the word ivermectin, if I just say the word ivermectin, I could get canceled right now. I mean, I may get pulled off the air and have my license revoked, Um, but I could say that, hey, use some cannabis or CBD. That'll help your COVID. That's It's so like, like we live in this, we got this global messaging about evidence-based science and the need for it that we all, okay, we're all going to wait for that. And yet when it comes to marijuana, it's free, it's quackery of the first degree. It's know, quack, quack. Kind of no funny. science needed. Oh, no, my daughter used it. It was good for her. You know, it's like, yeah. what is this? And then <laughs> and then we also heard this masking, right? That that you're not in this alone, that you're doing this for other people. But, but when it comes to marijuana, it's like, oh, you can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me because what I do is my business. It doesn't affect anybody else. So not true. Right. Yeah. yeah. Takes yeah. up a hospital, like hypernemesis takes up a hospital bed on the road. Right. You know, all the different problems that come with it are taxing our society. What you do has an impact on other people. So sorry in every single case. Right. So I found that really interesting. Those, the messaging was so readily accepted on COVID but when it comes to this topic, it's just a free for all you know, yeah, it is very yeah. odd. It gets a pass. Very odd. So, David Escovito, thank you for your innovative projects and leadership and prevention, substance use and addiction. One ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cured. A dollar investment in prevention yields $18 in return. So thank you, David. And Pamela McCall, thank you for your smart truths, your books, your advocacy. This has been an enlightening conversation. Good. And uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. This week's episode would not be possible without the generous support from our sponsor. A sincere and warm thank you to Isaac, the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis, doctors educating on the harms of marijuana. Visit IsaacOne.org, I-A-S-I-C-1.org, to view their medical library translated for public understanding, listen to their speaker series, and follow the science. Our producer is Dave Rivas from Davey Boy Productions. I am your host, Dr. Ronit Lev. We hope we brought your day a little bit more high truths. Mm-hmm.